Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to episode 63 of the Snyder Cut. I am Collider senior film reporter Jeff Snyder, and man, what a week it has been. Specifically, what a last Thursday it was. It was the Disney Investor Day. It was crazy. I'm sorry that this podcast tapes Thursday afternoon. You had to wait a whole week for my reaction to this Disney Investor Day, but it was really, it was like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, we must have churned out 40 or 50 articles in a span of 12 hours. Um, it, it was it was something. It was something to behold. And I think, like, you know, somebody going to answer that? Like, what is going on in this house? It's a, it's a house of anarchy, guys. Uh, we just had a blizzard. Got the baby niece in there. The phone's got like, my cable guy. All kinds of distractions. There were... God, I want to say, what, six or seven new Star Wars shows announced, a whole bunch of new Marvel stuff. It was like a, a, the great flood, if you will. Um, so let's talk about like some of the stuff that, that we actually got. We got uh, confirmation that Christian Bale is the villain in Thor Love and Thunder and that he's going to be playing Gore the God Butcher. I feel like those were Collider's actually highest performing articles. There was a lot of interest in... Thor for and, and Christian Bale's role specifically. Not a lot of people are familiar with that character, Gore the God Butcher. I know I wasn't. Um, and, and it sounds pretty interesting. Like, I can see why that character and working with Taika and, and you know, a, a big movie like Thor Love and Thunder, why that would appeal uh, to Christian Bale and, and get him back in the comic book movie world after, you know, after sort of conquering it with the, the Dark Knight movies. Um, God, we got we got confirmation that uh, that Miss Marvel is going to be in Captain Marvel two, and they finally confirmed Nia DaCosta is going to be uh, directing. Um, there wasn't much in the way of, of Shang Chi news. I mean, I feel like all the release the release dates sort of got shuffled around. Uh, not much in the way of Eternals. I feel like they're going to wait to 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 you know lift the lid on that well into twenty twenty one um maybe i don't know maybe we'll see like a super bowl spot for eternals it beats me i mean you know there's just very little around that kind of stuff around uh she hulk although i think that they're bringing back uh abomination right tim tim roth that's going to be in that um not a lot of uh, in the way of moon knight secret invasion was revealed as the title for the uh the nick fury sort of scrolls show with ben mendelson um, I God, I mean, there's just there's just so much stuff. There's a guardian, a Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. That sounds like it's going to be fun. There are a lot of um, shows sort of aimed at like younger audiences, like I Am Groot and Ironheart. Uh, yeah, we got we got to look, look at Wandavision. Another trailer for Wandavision. I thought I think Wandavision actually looks super interesting. Um. But I'm curious that like why that was the one that they wanted to lead with. I'm, I'm surprised it wasn't Falcon and Winter Soldier it, because Falcon, Falcon and Winter Soldier just feels like cut from the same cloth of the MCU, whereas WandaVision feels like it takes it in a bit of a different direction. It, it, it's obviously doing something different that we haven't really seen before. Um, but maybe that's the foot that Marvel wanted to lead with to show you, yeah, you know, the the movies are going to complement the tv shows and the tv shows are going to complement the movies but on as far as the shows go we are going to be taking you know um some big swings i, I think if they allow marvel to take some some real interesting chances uh we got our first look at at falcon and, and winter soldier and at loki falcon and winter soldier kind of looked like exactly what i was expecting um, I think that those guys have have good chemistry together, and, and you see some of that in the last you know couple couple seconds of the trailer where they're kind of joshing each other. I mean, this is Anthony Mackie's sort of big coming out party, and and I'm and I'm here for it. I I, I love Anthony Mackie, Sebastian actor. Sebastian Stan's a good actor too. Sebastian actor, Sebastian Stan, I I, I like as an actor. Um, I don't know, you know. I, I, hopefully, this series will give the Winter Soldier a bit like. It'll give Sebastian Stan a, little, a, little, a few more shades to play as Sebastian Stan. What am I saying? I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. It's going to give Sebastian Stan a chance to show that there are a few more layers to the Winter Soldier. Excuse me. I don't know what has gotten into me today. 
Uh, but Loki was really the trailer that kind of blew me away just because I didn't know what to expect from a Loki show, particularly taking the villain and, and making him the protagonist. Um, but I, I love like the music and, and just like that, that title card, the way that all the letters were changing. Like it really, it seemed to build. So I think that the Loki trailer was probably the most successful of the Marvel trailers that I saw last week. Um, what if looked interesting, you know, uh, but, but it's animated. So I don't know with animation, you can, you can do anything like we got uh, what a tr oh a, a title for Ant Man it's the Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and so you know I couldn't really stand all like the quantum talk that sort of took over the MCU. Um, so I, I don't I don't necessarily love it, but it, at least it's fun, you know Quantumania. And like they're, they're doubling down on it. it. It almost feels kind of tongue in cheek, which is kind of fitting for the Ant-Man movies. Um, Armor Wars. Rhodey is getting his own show. Don Cheadle. Uh, amazing. Like I, I just, does everyone come, <laughs> come to Kevin Feige with their hands out being like, uh, Kevin, you know, I, can, can I get my own series? Like what's going on here? Do we really need a uh, uh, Don Cheadle, Rhodey, Marvel show, Armor Wars, no. And what's funny is like, you know, with, with all these announcements and everything, a lot of people came out and said, well, you know, everyone wants to exclaim this is some new big bold day in Hollywood. Like this is what show West used to be or show East, you know, the, those old sort of confabs uh, that, that, that eventually morphed into CinemaCon. Um, and it's like, yes, but not really. I don't think we've ever seen anything on this scale. Their point though, was that, you know, all these projects get announced and then what half of them end up getting made. I don't think it's necessarily gonna be like that with, with these Disney projects. I think that most of these, if not all of them will actually happen. Uh, if, if I did have a guess about things that just didn't come together or they were, you know, started second guessing it, Armor Wars would probably be at the top of the list. <laughs> um, you know, they, they may, that you know they may change their minds on that i don't know I, you just don't know how firm any of this stuff is typically when studios do do one of these massive announcements uh things change the same way that they did with marvel and, and eternals right that was going to or what was it was it eternal what was that other show where was everybody together it wasn't eternals the one with the one you know with oh god that was calling Great. Um, <laughs> anyways, I, I don't know all my Marvel stuff. Clearly, I'm not the I'm not the Marvel expert here. Uh, the the thing that excited me the most was probably the Lightyear show that was announced. Like, I love Toy Story, and and it was kind of funny all the discourse with the Chris Evans thing. Like, I'm not playing Buzz Lightyear. I'm playing the human being that was the star of a movie that inspired the Buzz Lightyear character. I can, I, you know, I can't even imagine um, what that human being character is going to be like, uh, but it sounds like a fun idea, a fun way to sort of go back to and do an origin story for one of the two leads in, uh, in, in Toy Story to do, you know, to, I, I think, you know, Buzz Lightyear is, might be a more interesting character overall than Woody. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, and I do like that they didn't just recast the voice. You know, like Tim Allen is Buzz Lightyear. And as long as Tim Allen sounds like Tim Allen, I think if they have to keep him in that role, I, I know that he doesn't work like a, a, a Tom Hanks or some of the other people who do, you know, the, the, the voices for Toy Story, like, you know, Tim Allen's time, I mean, he's like a sitcom guy. <laughs> the, the, the kind of sitcoms that Republicans watch. But uh, I don't know. He, he's given the voice to this iconic movie character, and I, I would not want to see him replaced. Uh, so I'm glad that Chris Evans kind of clarified that, even though, if it, even though it kind of backfired on him. John Watts coming on to do Fantastic Four I thought was interesting. Um, you know, it, it provides some continuity, I think, in, in the MCU. I don't know how much Spider-Man 3 is going to 
tie into Fantastic Four. I don't know if that's how they're going to introduce mutants or if mutants are going to come in later in, in Doctor Strange 2. Um, but listen, th- there were a whole bunch of ways that they could have gone with something like Fantastic Four. And I think John Watts is a good choice based on what I've seen from him in his Spider-Man movies and based on Cop Car and things like that, man. Like, would you ever have guessed back in the day when John Watts was doing Clown, right? Well, that was him, I think. Uh, that, that he was going to wind up doing Fantastic Four a few years later. Like, well, when I was sitting there watching Cop Car at Sundance, I never thought he'd be directing a Spider-Man or, or, or a Fantastic Four movie. Uh, so, so hats off to John Watts, although I am definitely... I wish that he would do a, a, a maybe a smaller movie in between Spider-Man 3 and Fantastic Four. Maybe he will. Fantastic Four could be way, way, way down the line. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen some interesting conversations, you know, about Krasinski and Blunt uh, on, online that people would love to see them as as those characters. Um, I saw Stephen Graham as the thing. What was that? I mean, who did they say is... Uh... That's Human Torch. Oh, um, Anthony Ramos from, from In the Heights. Like, I, I, that's not a bad cast. Krasinski, Blunt, Ramos, and, and Stephen Graham. You, you would get me excited for that movie. Uh, Turning Red was like a, a movie about, or no, this is a, I don't know if it's a movie or show. I think it's a show uh, about a girl who, like, turns into a giant red panda. Uh, Sounds okay. I mean, that that's for kids. Iwaju, Tiana, really showing Disney's commitment to diversity. It's not all about, you know, these, these white uh, Disney princesses anymore. Like, Princess and the Frog had a ton of fans. Like, they really... Um, I, I just don't know if that was something that they originally envisioned as, as sort of becoming what, what it eventually did. Uh, so I'm glad that they're... That they're you know, exploring that property a little bit more, doing this Tiana series, Awaju sounds interesting. Uh, Raya and the Last Dragon, or Raya and the Last Dragon, that is going to be going to Disney Plus. I think that that's the one that they said is going to, um, is going to be behind a premier access paywall. It's interesting that, that sort of the the Asian stories, Mulan, Raya and the Last Dragon, are the ones that, are, that you have to pay extra for. I don't know really what is behind that corporate strategy or whatever. Uh, there's a Baymax series coming from Big Hero 6. I never even saw that. There's a Moana series coming. It was so funny. Uh, you know, all my my high school buddies were showing me like their, their Spotify top playlists and how many of them had like the Frozen or Moana soundtracks on there. So when they get in the car with their kids, that's just all that they want to listen to. Um, Zootopia Plus feels like a whole like another universe within a universe. It's like a, an ecosystem within a universe. And Canto sounds really good. And uh, they announced that Lin-Manuel Miranda is going to be doing original music for that. Uh, Peter Pan and Wendy, Pinocchio, Cruella. I think that those were all sort of announced for, for Disney Plus, right? Whew, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. They got, what, Andy Samberg and John Mulaney to do the voices. Those are kind of perfect. Although the, I saw some tweet that where it's like, it sounds like the kind of movie like that you'd see on on Thirty Rock or something. Like it sounds almost like a parody of of a Disney movie. Um, geez. All right, then we got into Star Wars. My God, and all the Lucasfilm stuff. Uh, they confirmed the Bad Batch. They, they they dropped a new show, Rangers of the New Republic, Rogue Squadron. They actually brought on Patty Jenkins to direct, and and that's that was probably the biggest thing out of the entire Disney Investor Day to have. You know, we have a, a new female director on a Star Wars movie, and it's Patty Jenkins who, who sort of turned her back, or, or not turned her back, but left the Wonder Woman universe to come over and do this. And they made a really neat video with her, you know, was sort of paying homage to her father. I thought like that that whole portion of the announcement was kind of brilliantly handled. Um, they announced it an Ahsoka Tano series. I'm not all up to date on The Mandalorian. I mean, all this stuff just makes my head spin. Star Wars Visions, they announced. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, they confirmed. Andor, they confirmed. Um, and we got title treatments for all these things. Lucasfilm is also doing Indiana Jones 5, uh, which is going to go in the spring for a summer 22 release with Harrison Ford back. Uh, and then Willow. So, God, and I think what else? There was uh, Children of Blood and Bone. Like that, see, that, that's one of those that's like 
Lucasfilm would love to be doing some more stuff outside of Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And, and so they have to, you know, whether, I mean, Willow is an old property, but like they need to come up with stuff like, like Children uh, of, of Blood and Bone. They need to embrace those kinds of properties. But if I had to pick something that, you know, on this slate that is probably just like a long shot to actually go, it would be that project. You know, maybe Kathleen Kennedy will put her, her weight and muscle behind that. Um, but you know, they, they have a lot bigger problems. Like they have this Indiana Jones franchise. that's just kind of sitting there and, you know, they're trying to get a fifth movie with, with James Manville, but you have to get that right. And, and same with these, like this new star Wars movie and these star Wars shows like live action star Wars. I think people have sort of finally come around on the idea that these new movies that they released were, were just not very good. Um, you know, Force Awakens, I think you could make an argument with what's good and, and it delivered the fan service everybody was looking for. But I don't know, Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker, these aren't movies that I would necessarily go back and watch a second time. So Lucasfilm has its hands full, sort of trying to write this universe and, and do some course correction. Um, God, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that came out of, uh, you know, the, the Disney Investor Day. It was really just head spinning. I was still getting caught up 12 hours later the following day. Um, I think if you're, if you are a Disney investor, like you have to feel pretty confident about the future of this company. Like they just totally owned, um, everybody else in the space, Netflix, HBO max. Uh, and, and this stuff's been going to roll out over a period of years. So I don't know. I, I, I think that Disney plus is very much worth it. And uh, I, I watched a terrific movie on Disney Plus this past weekend, which we're going to talk about at the end of the podcast. But all, all in all, I'd have to say it was a very successful day for Disney. I thought everything went pretty smoothly. Nobody wears a tie anymore in these videos, which is kind of funny. We we're all kind of poking fun of that in the Collider Slack. Like you, you can afford uh, you can afford to greenlight twenty zillion shows, but you can't afford ties for the executives. Hmm. In general, though, I don't think I'd recommend that that strategy to you know to too many companies. Like it was just, it was a lot. It was it was a lot. It was almost too much, and things got lost in the shuffle. And uh, I don't know. I I, I might have maybe presented half of that if I was Disney and, and saved. But it's like, yeah, which half? Do you, do you pick and choose, or do you just sort of? I don't know. They're in a tricky position. The streaming wars, it's all just like announce, announce, announce. And, you know, we'll, we'll figure this stuff out later, but it's all about getting that stock price up. And, and uh, that's why they call it investor day guys. Like a couple of years ago, nobody was on these calls, you know, when, when the MCU was first born and, and, and Disney was on investor calls talking about this kind of stuff, like there used to be one or two reporters listening. And now everyone is just glued. And, and uh, I don't know, like it, to, to like to deal with like the minutia of every single title, I, I just think that there were maybe ways for Disney to have maximized its coverage and and, and drawn it out more than just like a here's a 24 hour avalanche of, of of stuff. But again, that that that's their prerogative. Anyways, we can move it along because uh, I, I got a hard out on the show today. We just broke some news earlier this morning. Ben Stiller is in talks to direct the 7-5 for MGM. This is a project that he'd been circling when it was over at Sony. It's about a crooked uh, bunch of cro crooked cops, a bad precinct in, in the NYPD in the 80s. It's a kind of fascinating documentary from Tiller Russell, who did The Last Narc we've talked about on this podcast. He actually has the Night Stalker show coming out. I didn't realize, I didn't even realize that was him. Um, and he has the Silk Road movie. Like this guy, Taylor Russell, I just, I love his taste and material. He, he's telling some really interesting stories. Uh, ben Stiller coming off a DGA award for Escape at Dannemora. I think that this is the, the right next step for him. You know, I think people would expect Stiller to, to get into doing comedies, but clearly he, he's shown an interest in, in dramas and some, some edgy kind of gritty stuff. I, I don't think this is necessarily a done deal by any stretch, but uh, I don't know. Stiller's been involved just circling this one for quite a while. Um, I think that they, you know, they had eyed people like Aaron Taylor Johnson, Nicholas Holt. You know, I don't think that they have any cast attached at this point. Um, but but that's probably the level of, of guy that they're going to get for this. And, and again, this is a really fascinating documentary. Uh, yeah, we've all sort of seen crooked cop stories and, and tales like this. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Based on what Stiller did with that that Showtime series, I think it could be a really interesting choice for this. I, I hope that this uh, moves along quickly. Chris Pine signing on to do Dungeons and Dragons. I don't like this. I mean, I don't like. I, I don't really like this for Chris Pine, who has some interesting stuff percolating. Uh, you know, Wonder Woman 1984 is coming out next week, and the reviews that I've read have not been great. The, the, the things that I've heard is that Wonder Woman 1984 is kind of a mess. So maybe Chris Pine was nervous about all that and, and just, you know, grabbed the next big budget job he could get. Maybe Chris Pine is a secret Dungeons and Dragons nerd or something, but like, I'm just, I'm not going to see this movie. I don't care who is in Dungeons and Dragons. I do not give a flying fuck about d and uh, So I'm surprised that they actually got someone of, of Chris Pine's caliber. Um, yeah, because I thought this was going to end up being like Warcraft or something, you know? Where you get like Ben Foster. Uh, I don't know. Um, but good luck to Chris Pine. You know, if anyone can make that movie like charming, I, I guess that's him. Like people like Chris Pine, right? I, I like Chris Pine. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him in the Olivia Wilde movie that he's doing right now. But Dungeons and Dragons is just not my property, obviously. Uh, Tom Cruise, we got some audio from him. Holy crap. This has been a kind of fascinating, um, like, like debate in, in, in pop culture here the last couple of days because some people were like, well, you should never yell at, at subordinates like that. And others like, well, this is the coronavirus. And like, you need to drill this into people's heads. Like, if they don't get it by now, like, they're either not going to get it or they need some kind of tongue cruise type tongue lashing so that it sinks in. Uh, I thought. I thought it was great. <laughs> like, like, listen, I, I know Tom Cruise is a Scientologist and he's, uh, you know, aware of and maybe even oversees certain abuses that that, that, that uh, organization uh, imposes on its members. <clears throat> like, I'm not here to say Tom Cruise is a, is a great guy behind the scenes, uh, but I would vote for Tom Cruise for president because, listen, like, imagine being in Russia or China and thinking you're going to fuck with the United States and Tom Cruise picks up that red phone in the Oval Office or something. And he's like, it's just, who would mess with America with Tom Cruise being the president? Um, I think that when it comes to safety on set, you can't really be too forceful. And, and I, I think that, you know, we don't know the backstory of this. We don't know what people were doing to merit that kind of uh, rant. We don't know if they had been warned before. You know, maybe maybe this is a repeat offender sort of thing. But I, I think that this is the sort of thing that ultimately benefits everybody. Everybody needs to hear that, and they need to hear it coming from someone of, of Tom Cruise's stature. Um, because I do think if, if people are afraid in the workplace. Bosses are afraid to talk to their employees a certain way, to, to you know, and everybody's just, like, walking on eggshells around each other. It's nice to see Tom, Plex, Tom Cruise actually flex his muscle and his power and be like, no, like the next time you guys fuck up, you're gone. You're fired. Like, and like, okay, if you can't handle some F-bums and you're working in Hollywood, get the fuck out of town, dude. Like you have thin skin. I, it's been amazing. I had to write I had to write to a Netflix publicist and tell them, you need to grow a thicker skin. Because in this business, you're, you ain't going to last. Your job as a publicist, you are a, a human shield. That is your job is to sit there and take the bullets that the, that the media fires at your company to shield your company and protect your company. So if you aren't willing to, to take those bullets and take those hits, you're in the wrong profession, okay? Just like you're in the wrong profession if you can't handle being chewed out by a star like Tom Cruise. Get off the crew because that's what these people are here to do. That's what Tom Cruise – I mean, he, he's not just the star. He's the producer. And so any overages, any delays, like Tom, that stuff's like coming out of Tom Cruise's pocket or his fees, or, you know, like, whatever it is. Um, I just think that there, there, there is too much at stake. It's not just Mission Impossible. It is the future of this industry. I, I think Tom Cruise was kind of spot on. And, and so whether or not you disagree of, of how he went about relaying that message, that message was received loud and fucking clear. And I think that set is going to be safer for it. So Tom Cruise, 
you know, maybe some people think of you as an asshole now. Um, you know, maybe you were behind the leak of your own audio because you thought it made you look great. Uh, you know, I, I saw some some Scientology uh, people or former Scientology people, you know, saying that that's a distinct possibility that he was behind this leak uh, leak himself. But I don't care who fucking leaked it. Like maybe it was recorded surreptitiously, and maybe. It was unethical of the sun to run that audio, but I, I just don't, I don't think you can argue with the message that, that Cruz is trying to get, to get across there. I, I love the guy and I loved him even more after this. Jared Leto, Oscar winner, as opposed to, to Tom Cruise, which is crazy. Jared Leto is signing on to star in the Apple series, We Crashed, which is about the rise and fall of We Work. You know, they rented all these, all they snapped up all this real estate and we're going to turn into this office space for, for, you know, people who need office space. And now nobody's going to the office. Everybody's working from home. Uh, obviously, we were crashed long before the, the pandemic. Um, so Jared Leto is, is circling the role of Adam Newman, I believe, who was the CEO. At one point, this guy was worth $750 million. And then, yeah, like in the span of six weeks, they went from like a, you know, $40 billion valuation to like talk of bankruptcy. Uh, I never listened to the podcast and I actually don't, I'm not that te- like familiar with this story. Cause like, I, I don't, I never needed to use we work or whatever the hell that was. Um, so I'm kind of interested in this, you know, like this is a, an interesting story of, uh, of hubris and Jared Leto. I don't know. We, we don't often see him get to play this, this these kinds of uh weaselly characters which he could kind of be perfect for we got a glimpse of him in the business world in american psycho but now he's he's front and center in this uh we got a new revenge of the nerds movie on the way from seth MacFarlane and the lucas brothers bit of an odd choice because the lucas brothers don't really strike me as nerds i mean maybe they look like stereotypical nerds right but these guys seem fucking cool like these guys are just cool cats so um but they're gonna be anyways they're gonna be writing it and they're coming off of Judas and the Black Messiah. Like that's why you're starting to hear a lot of stuff about the Lucas brothers. I think that they really, it, it, I think it's a good sign. I think it bodes well for Judas and the Black Messiah. If these guys are getting all kinds of jobs around town. Seth MacFarlane seems like the, the, the a, a solid producer for uh, a Revenge of the Nerds movie. I like the first Ted. Didn't really like Ted Two and Million Ways to Die in the West was terrible. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I am kind of hit and miss on, on Seth MacFarlane overall. But I also, I mean, who else could have really done this? Like, who, Lord Miller or Point Grey, Rogan's Company? Like, you know, Seth MacFarlane, I think, I think this is a, a good match of material. Revenge of the Nerds, obviously, you know, Variety sort of the way that they positioned it. It's not a remake. It's more of a reboot. I don't even know if it's going to take, take uh, place on a college campus. That was never alluded to. This could take place in the, in the workplace or something. Um, you know, they tried to do this like 10, 15 years ago when I first got out to LA, they were filming a Revenge of the Nerds remake with Adam Brody at Emory University. And I think Emory got cold feet at a couple, like a couple weeks into production. They were just like, we can't have, we, our, our school can't be associated with uh, the hijinks of this movie. They pulled the plug. Uh, so, so this is a good IP. I think it's worth revisiting. It's not untouchable. In fact, it needs to be touched because the original Revenge of the Nerds, as much as I love it, was wildly sort of inappropriate and problematic. You had people dressing up as other people and having sex with their girlfriends, which is called rape. Uh, you know, if you look at that um, and just like panty raids. And I mean, listen, some of this stuff is, is, is sex comedy hijinks. Uh, and I think has to be viewed in that light, but you know, the way things are these days, if you go back and watch Revenge of the Nerd, it's like the, the, the nerds should have been locked up and thrown in prison, some of them. Uh, so that'll be on Seth MacFarlane and the Lucas Brothers to figure that out. Pam and Tommy. This was one uh, that I really wanted to talk about today. I have been holding this Pam and Tommy story, okay, for two years. Two years. I went back into the Collider system. And I looked. When's the last time I updated our Pam and Tommy story? November 2018. So now it's December 2020. Finally, they get talent attached to this thing. Nobody calls and picks up the phone for Jeff. Nobody appreciates the favor that I was doing for them. I was into it with Annapurna TV. I was into it with Hulu. I was into it with Seth Rogen's company and his people. Like, 
No one fucking gave me a heads up at all. So you bet your ass that I just let everything out that I knew. And that includes James Franco. James Franco was originally going to direct this uh, limited series and play Tommy Lee. Remember, this was happening like right after the disaster artist. It also happened around the time that all these allegations with Franco surfaced. So that sort of thwarted the momentum. That made it like kind of impossible to get this project set up. And they kicked Franco to the curb. You know, uh, Dave Frank, and you could tell Frank was still involved, was involved because Dave Franco is a producer on this. Dave Franco is not producing shit without James Franco. Like, so the Francos were absolutely involved in this, both of them, two years ago. Seth Rogen's going to play the guy who stole the tape. They ended up getting Sebastian Stan and Lily James. Now, these are both solid actors, I would say, like good actors for these parts. Um, do either of them look like the characters? Do I see them? No, I can't really see Lily James as Pam Anderson. At no point has I, have I ever salivated over Lily James. I mean, she's a very pretty girl, but there's a difference between pretty and you know hot or sexy or whatever. And um, so I don't see that at all. But at the same time, you know, I think that they were looking at some models and, you know, people who could play Pamela Anderson, blonde, beautiful, curvy, that kind of thing. These people aren't necessarily great actors. So it's a bit of a trade-off. You don't necessarily get someone who looks like Pam Anderson, but I think Lily James is a better actress than anyone who they were looking at to play Pam. Sebastian Stan, same kind of thing. I don't really see him playing Tommy Lee. I, I just, he doesn't, he doesn't give off that vibe. James Franco gave off a Tommy Lee vibe. He would have been perfect casting, but I get why you can't really do this, at least right now. Like, there's still a lot of, Franco's really like retreated and, and hasn't addressed a lot of these allegations. A lot of the stuff is he said, she said, you know? Um, to me, there's a big difference between and, and uh, there's a big difference between some sexual allegations because sex is tricky, and then there's physical abuse, which to me, I mean, I, like I said, you know, with, with the Johnny Depp stuff last week, and, and I'll say it with regards to Shia LaBeouf this week, there's never an excuse to raise your hand to a woman. There's never an excuse to rape a woman either. I'm just saying, sex is more complicated than physical abuse. Um, and so, you know, Franco, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that he eventually will get another chance in this industry. He's just very talented and, and people seem to, to like him. Um, but yeah, he, he's got he's to gotta do something to, to get himself back out there, whether it's some statement of contrition or, I don't know, a donation to, to some type of group. Because um, I, I want James Franco back, you know? Um, I want I want Aziz back. I mean, like I said, tricky stuff, complicated. Um, I was actually, you know, I watched Pieces of a Woman, which I'm going to get to at the, uh, in a little bit. Pieces of a Woman starts Shia LaBeouf. I was curious whether Netflix was going to delay the release of Pieces of a Woman after FKA Twigs, uh, you know, piece came out. Um, and if you haven't read that, you know, it's a very powerful piece of writing. I have been a Shia LaBeouf defender since day one, I, I love the guy. He clearly, clearly has some demons, clearly is dealing with some, needs to deal with some issues. Uh, and, and I think that um, he'll, he will continue to, to do that work. Like, I think that Shia has been, you know, dealing with the drugs and alcohol stuff, but he, there's probably some, some anger management uh, issues that he needs to deal with separately. Um, and I hope that he gets that help because, yeah, reading that FKA Twigs thing, it was just like every word of this just rings really true. Um, I mean, you know, we, ha we have to believe victims, but uh, it, it always helps when their stories just sound kind of irrefutable. Um, and so I'm sorry that that happened to FKA Twigs and, uh, and yeah, hope that, that Shia gets, gets the help that he needs because he, he's a massive talent. Um, and, and really good in, in Pieces of a Woman where he's kind of been overshadowed by, by Vanessa Kirby. Um, there was a Sundance 2021 lineup. They, they kind of threw it all out there. Every, every uh, you know, 
category or section or whatever. And what I noticed was that there's a, a lot fewer stars. Like, you know, in any given year, you go to Sundance, you could see a bunch of A24 titles, a bunch of uh, Fox Searchlight titles, more like, you know, bigger star driven stuff. There's really none of that this year. The, 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 the stars are a lot, I mean, they're just very indie. Like Sundance is going back to its indie roots. And I think it's refreshing. Like I, I never needed, you know, all, all these gigantic stars coming through. They're good for, you know, to set up interview suites and get sponsors and stuff like that. But uh, like kudos to Sundance for, for just sort of going back to the basics and, and programming like a super hyper indie list that, you know, there, there were only a handful of titles I was truly excited about. Um, a couple midnight things like Violation sounded really good. This rape revenge movie. Um, I don't know. You read my article on Collider to, to see what I'm actually looking forward to. But there wasn't anything that was like, oh my god, I'd cut off my arm right now to like see that movie. Um, the Blacklist also unveiled its, its itself this week. Uh, it seemed like there were more projects on the Blacklist this year. Maybe, maybe I'm off on that. It's always right around like 70 or 75 projects or so. Uh, the one that, that we singled out this year was Excelsior, the Stan Lee, Jack Kirby movies about the early days of, of Marvel, the, you know, the company's rise and fall. It only, it only got nine votes. It wasn't really high up there on the list, but there was, um, you know, like, like always, some, some diamonds in the rough, a lot, a lot of interesting gems. So, so, you know, check out the blacklist, run, take a look at the log lines. See what stands out to you. Some of these projects are, are going to, you know, be getting made next year that just haven't been made yet, which makes them eligible, like the Will Smith movie Emancipation. Uh, HBO Max finally signed its Roku deal. Congrats to all the, the Roku users out there who can now enjoy Wonder Woman 1984 on Christmas Day. I never really cared. I wasn't, you know, sitting on pins and needles waiting for this to happen because I don't use Roku. I'm an Apple TV guy. And just, um, I love Apple TV. I've been yelling at dad for the last 48 hours. Like, dad, you should just cut the cord. Why are we paying so much for cable? And there's all these issues and the cable goes out. The cable box sucks. Like Apple TV has just been very, very consistent. I find that I can get almost anything that I need on there. So, but, you know, I, I don't, I've never used a Roku. So maybe you Roku folks just, just adore it. Uh, Michael Douglas and Christoph Waltz signing on to play Reagan and Gorbachev in Reagan and Gorbachev, a limited series. I really like, like the casting for both of those. I can definitely see Michael Douglas as, as Reagan. Christoph Waltz as Gorbachev seems like a, a layup, just like a, of course, like a eureka moment. And the two of them together, I think will make a pretty interesting pair. Ben Affleck doing Dan Trachtenberg's Houdini movie, which has moved over to Disney via Studio 8. So this was something that was at Lionsgate to start. Somehow Jeff Robinov got his hands on it at Studio 8, and he recently set it up at Disney. Uh, I don't know if this is a theatrical thing or something for Disney+. Plus. Ben Affleck's not even going to play Houdini. I think that was the common assumption when this was first announced. But uh, Slash Film came in and clarified that Ben Affleck's going to be playing like an agent of some kind, uh, whether it's a, you know, an agent of the government, an agent of Hollywood. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't read the, the Houdini script, nor am I terribly familiar with the legend of Houdini. But, um, you know, I, part of me was a, li a little relieved that he's not playing Houdini because I, I couldn't really see that. I just always pictured Houdini as maybe like a smaller kind of like Chaplin-esque guy, which is maybe why I thought... Um, Robert, I like. I'd love to see Robert Downey Jr. playing Houdini. I think he'd be kind of really interesting. Um, but a, but not a bad choice for for Ben Affleck working with a guy like like Dan Trachtenberg, an up and comer. This is uh, on the heels of him signing on to play the lead in uh, in George Clooney's movie. Um, Alicia Vikander doing an HBO A twenty four series Irma Vep based on the movie by Olivier Assayas. Never saw Irma Vep. Sounded. Mildly interesting. There, I mean, that, again, that's an interesting pairing. Alicia Vikander, Olivia Esayas. She, she fits the mold of his sort of classic, uh, you know, his typical leading lady. And uh, whenever A24 and HBO get together, you got to pay attention. These are, these are two of the, the companies with the best taste in Hollywood. 
Ana de Armas books the female lead in The Gray Man alongside Chris Evans and Ryan Gosling. That's the Russo Brothers next Netflix movie. I mean, she is just, you know, smoking hot right now uh, in terms of her career. And, and so it makes sense that she would sign on to, to you know, work with these two gigantic A-list stars and, and, uh, and, the, and the most successful directors of all time, I suppose you could say. Christopher Storer, the producer of Eighth Grade, is directing Worst Man. That's the Pete Davidson, Colin Jost movie. Uh, that'll be interesting to see whether that gets a theatrical release or becomes more of like a Peacock type of play, because I think Peacock could actually stand to use some more original movies. For Storer, um, his name was all over the blacklist as far as producing certain stuff, I want to say. Um, so th that, that's definitely got to keep your eye on. Julia Roberts doing the Apple series, The Last Thing He Told Me. You know, it, it, she's probably looking at Nicole Kidman being like, how come Nicole Kidman gets all these... She has a new HBO series every six months, a, a big prestige series where her names splash across billboards and stuff. Like that should be Julia Roberts, you know, Ho homecoming was good, but it was, it wasn't a show like the undoing or big little lies that like everybody was sort of watching. Like, homecoming was a weird fucking show. So I, I think Julia Roberts is right to sort of emulate, take a page out of Nicole's career playbook and, and just line up uh, some, some interesting limited series. I still want to see her playing the PTA mom. The, you know, I think it was Kelly Peters, if, if I'm remembering her correctly. The Disney Investor Day also announced four more seasons of Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That'll take you the run up to season 18. I can't even imagine, you know, if you had told me when I started watching Always Sunny back in the day that there were going to be 18 seasons of the show and it was going to set the record for the longest running live action comedy in TV history. Like, I would have called you absolutely crazy. Like, the, the show lucky to even be renewed. But hey, I guess once you get Danny DeVito, you get a, a, a permanent green light. Good for these guys. Like the show has not really lost any steam. Yeah, some seasons are better than others. Some episodes are, you know, weaker than others. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're going to be getting more of the gang because I need them in, in 2021. Florence Pugh signing on to the murder mystery, The Maid. Getting a lot of murder mysteries these days in the wake of Knives Out. People. No, they like their their whodunits. I guess murder on the uh, murder uh, on the Orient Express. Also, they've got the sequel, Death in the Nile, that got delayed. Um, but yeah, people like a game. They they like to you know keep them guessing. And Florence Pugh is a rising star and probably like a, a great choice for this. Even though I'm not 100 percent familiar with like the the log line. Um, well, you know, it's kind of the same entry point as Knives Out, right? If, if Florence Pugh is, in fact, playing the maid. Naomi Aki cast as Whitney Houston, and I Want to Dance with Somebody. I ended up watching Education last night, and she really stood out, Naomi Aki. I was like, is that, who is that? Um, so that's a big role for her, you know, to, to play Whitney Houston. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, sounds interesting. I like Whitney Houston's music. I, I grew up in the 90s, stand, you know, doing slow dances to, to Whitney and that kind of stuff. Lizzie McGuire reboot, Dead at Disney Plus. I never watched Lizzie McGuire. Like Whitney Houston, Lizzie McGuire means nothing to me. Sorry, Lizzie fans, that show's not going to be moving forward. Who cares? HBO Max is pulling Chappelle show uh, based on the, you know, a request of Dave Chappelle. I don't understand this. Are, are companies that like, especially after HBO Max, like just like told all of Hollywood to go fuck itself, right? But by, by putting all of WB Slate, uh, you know, 2021 Slate on the streaming service, now HBO Max respects talent. And when Dave Chappelle wants his, his show off of the, you know, the service, they're like, oh yes, Dave Chappelle, of course. I just, it opens up a very, very weird precedent. Why can't any artist come to HBO Max or Netflix or whoever now and be like, you know what? I, I signed that deal 10 years ago and, and, and streaming wasn't even a thing. And, and I just, I'm not getting compensated properly. Can you take this off your service until I am properly? Like, when is this proper, like, when is this proper compensation coming? You think Viacom is going to like redo the fucking deal that it had with Dave Chappelle? Dave Chappelle is just burying a show that has brought joy to, to, every, you know, millions of people like Dave Chappelle. I, I love Dave Chappelle kind of turning into a bit of a prick lately. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at uh, my show and uh, I'm not getting money for it. And it makes me feel sad. Well, like, what about all these people who are maybe halfway through binging uh, or, not, or just watching the Chappelle show and now they can't watch the other half because it got pulled off all their streaming services. 
that makes them feel sad. Like Dave Chappelle, I don't know, maybe look into your heart, dude. And like, uh, you know, fucking just let the shit out there. Just let it be. Okay. You're not being compensated properly. You're worth like a hundred million dollars. Like I couldn't even fathom having that much money, let alone spending it in a lifetime. The greed of these Hollywood stars. And, and it's not just, I know it's the corporations too, Dave Chappelle. I don't want to put it all on you and talent that, that you guys are the greedy ones. The corporations are the greedy ones too. That's why they made a fucking deal that, that screwed the talent it wanted to be in bed with. But like, it's the fans who lose in this situation. And to me, that's not cool. Particularly over something like fucking Chappelle's show. Like this is uh, this is old. Like, what do you even fucking care? Not not a fan of the way Dave Chappelle has been going uh, about his. Uh, I signed a bad deal 10, 15 years ago when I needed the money. Not a fan of it at all. Lion King. That was one thing we didn't talk about during the Disney Investor Day. They brought in uh, Pharrell Williams, um, Zimmer, and Nicholas Patel to do the music for the new Lion King prequel slash sequel that Barry Jenkins is going to direct. Uh, that's a power trio right there, you know, bringing a little bit of everything to the table. CAA signed the WGA deal and can now represent writers. This is actually happening, not like the last time where they announced it. And WGA is like, wait, what? We don't even have a deal. Uh, I would like to see this town return to normal. It's felt very weird the last year and a half with writers not being repped by the two major agencies. Uh, hopefully they'll figure out the affiliate production stuff. WME still hasn't. Um, and, and, and maybe that's smart. Maybe it's just better for WME to just be like, you know what, the, the money that we'd make off of writers is not, an, it doesn't compete with like the money that we'd make off of these packages and this affiliate production. Like maybe, I mean, I, I think that WME is in the representation business and wants to get back to its core business of representing writers, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder if, if it's, if it's a necessity. You know, uh, Bad Bunny has signed on to join Bullet Train. Bad Bunny, Bad Bunny. I like this guy. I, I like him in that commercial he's got. And um, I think it's like a Corona commercial, maybe. I forget. And uh, and he's got Narcos Mexico coming up soon. So uh, Bad Bunny definitely lining up a lot of work. Like People, people are excited about that guy. Uh, obviously, he has a, a big fan base, um, you know, Puerto Rican singer. Yaya Abdul Mateen and Isaac Gonzalez sign on to join Jake Gyllenhaal and Ambulance. This was the one where Jake Gyllenhaal and Dylan O'Brien were going to be uh, playing brothers. Well, you know, Dylan O'Brien was there was a brother character they were looking at Dylan O'Brien for. Then they're like, okay, Yaya's schedule has opened up or something like that. Can we rewrite the brother? Like, they don't have to be brothers, do they? If we can get Yaya and pair him with Jake, that's a great pairing. Let's let's rewrite it a little bit. Uh, so that is sound, that sounds like what they did for Michael Bay's next movie, and I'm looking forward to that. Jamie Alexander back as Lady Sif in Thor four. Sure, whatever. I, I I don't care. It's you know it's a bit of fan service. Stephen Daldry circling Shuggy Bane at A24. That's a project that Scott Rudin is producing based on a huge book. Stephen Daldry, a class act all the way, seems like a good fit for that. Jamie Bell and Margaret Qualley starring as Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and Fred and Ginger. Uh, odd casting for, for that. I, I don't know that. I mean, Jamie Bell, Billy Elliot, I, I, I can see that. Um, Margaret Qualley is Ginger Rogers. Sure. Whatever. I'm, you know, I, I'm not really a, a, a Fred and Ginger type of guy. I didn't grow up watching that stuff. So whatever. Uh, David kept writing the green Hornet and Cato movie. He, I think he's a good get for them. Like that that's being mounted independently. And he's one of the biggest screenwriters in town. So uh, probably a, a, a coup for that project. Same as Brian K. Vaughn writing a Buck Rogers series. I think I alluded to this last week. Like, I don't know Buck Rogers. Like, who is this for? Like my grandparents? Um, but Brian K. Vaughn is the writer behind my favorite comic, Saga, which is just brilliant. If you have never, I'm not a comic book guy. If you've never read the Saga comic book, it's like a masterpiece. So Brian K. Vaughn, maybe you will be the guy who gets me interested in Buck Rogers. All right. Um, before we talk trailers and reviews, we'll do a quick mailbag question uh, from Will Julius. He just says, hey, Jeff, I was curious. What is your favorite scoop you've ever broken? Thanks, as always, and pumped to see Collider. FYC is back. I'm sure there were some other mailbag questions this week, um, but I, I didn't really have time to, to gather them all together. So if I did miss your question this week, I'll do my best to answer it next week. Uh, as far as my favorite scoop, Will, 
I mean, my favorite was probably like Jason Momoa to play the crow, just because I always wanted to break who is going to be the next crow. Now Jason Momoa is no longer playing the crow. So I got to be back on that beat. Um, yeah, I, I really thought I had it. That, that's sort of the, the, the dream scoop for me is to tell you who the next crow is. Um, but as far as like the, you know, the biggest scoops I've had, the one that, that I'll always remember, it, it's, you know, James Corden hosting the, the, the late show or whatever, taking over from Ferguson. It's Mahersha Ali doing True Detective, uh, Jared Leto being cast as the Joker, like, you know, the, the, the big things that, that will maybe stand the test of time. Um, like I, I teamed up with the Boston Globe and did the announcement for Spotlight. Like that was something I held for a year because Tom McCarthy needed time and privacy to research the movie, uh, you know, within the Catholic church without saying, Oh, I'm making a movie about, you know, priests who abuse kids. Like, so I felt like I was a part of that almost, um, particularly, you know, doing an even break with, with the Boston globe at, at the same time, which I was happy to do. You know, it's not like Boston, the Boston globe breaks a lot of movie news, you know, but but they broke that story. I mean, it's about their reporters. So I felt like it would only be the fair thing for Variety and, and the Boston Globe to go at the same time uh, for, for that announcement. There's a whole bunch. Um, you know, I'll have to do some more thinking on it. But those, those are some of the favorites that, that uh, off the top of my head. That and Dakota Johnson starring in Fifty Shades of Grey. That was a monster. Uh, all right. The trailers. We talked about Loki, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and WandaVision. I think it was a pretty good day for Marvel. Uh, we got a trailer for Nomadland finally, really showing off some of the beautiful score in that movie. It's a tough film to to, to you know to build a trailer for because there aren't a lot of big moments. Um, it's a very quiet film, a very lyrical film. I showed the trailer to Dad, and he was just like, "No, I'm not not interested." Um, but I, I thought it was you know maybe it wasn't like the best trailer of the year, but that was pretty effective. We got a trailer for Anthony Mackie's new movie, Outside the Wire, which looked like a nifty, you know, Netflix sci-fi thing, kind of, you know, on par with, um, I don't think the budget was on par, but it, it looks like best case scenario, it'll be like a Project Power Old Guard extraction type of thing. But maybe it'll be better than those. Those were all kind of two and a half star movies. And that's what I expect Outside the Wire to be, but maybe it'll surprise us. We saw a quick trailer for the a glitch in the matrix, which was, which was announced as part of uh, the, um, the Sundance lineup. That's a new documentary from Rodney Asher, who did the Kubrick film, uh, you know, like the shining documentary room 237, which I really liked. But then he did the nightmare, which was like about sleep paralysis. And I hated that movie. I, I wish I had watched walked out at Sundance. So we'll see if uh, a glitch in the matrix is more room 237 or more than nightmare. We got a full trailer for Shadow in the Cloud from Roseanne Liang. I, I love that movie. I had a blast with it. I think it is a really great trailer. Um, yeah, it's just a, a lot of fun. And it captures the energy and the style uh, of that movie, in and, and which Chloe Moretz gives a really good performance. And then finally, we got a trailer for The Night Stalker, a docu-series on Netflix about uh, Richard Ramirez. I had just read that book like a year ago. Is that behind me up here? Where is it? Yeah, here we go. The Night Stalker, uh, great book, chilling case. I mean, fascinating story. Um, so I, I, I'm definitely looking forward to diving into those. Netflix was kind enough to send the screeners over. We are going to end the show. We've got a few more minutes left with reviews. I'm going to try to do this lightning round because there were a lot of them. I watched three of the five small acts titles from Steve McQueen over on Amazon. I did not watch Mangrove, which was the big one. I did watch Alex Weedle, Education, and Lover's Rock. Lover's Rock was probably my favorite of those three, but I also thought it was a little overrated. Like, uh, it was 67 minutes of people dancing, and it is, you know, it's a mood. You know, you're at a party with these people. There's not a lot in the way of story. So it's sort of about capturing a moment. And, and on that level, I think I can appreciate it, but I also don't think it's one of the best movies of the year by any stretch. Education, I was, uh, I, I, I quite liked. Um, I think that that did the best job of maybe showing, like, li like making the point that I think Steve McQueen was trying to make. Uh, I, I did appreciate the the first half of Education a little bit more because I really like the kids, and in the second half it becomes more about the parents um, and, and that kind of stuff. Alex Weedle 
didn't really care for, uh, just felt kind of familiar. Yeah, I, I'll tell you one thing though. I think you gotta, I gotta recommend watching all these small acts movies with, with subtitles on. Um, I think I watched two without subtitles and I was kind of struggling with, with the accents. I mean, I, you know, they're speaking English, but in these heavy kind of, um, you know, J- Jamaican accents, a lot of you know, Caribbean accents and stuff. It was, uh, it was a little tough at times, but I am really looking forward to finishing up uh, the, this, you know, the small acts movies with Red, White and Blue with John Boyega and then uh, Mangrove with Letitia Wright. Uh, I saw Joe Manganiello's new movie, Arch Enemy, not good, not good. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. It's produced by Spectre Vision. I respect what those guys are trying to do over there. You know, Elijah Wood. I'm sure they're all lovely guys. I don't think I've liked a single movie Spectre Vision has produced. They're, they're just operating on a different level than I am. Arch Enemy seemed like a, a very ambitious movie that just didn't have the budget to tell the story it wanted to tell. So it subs in a lot of stuff with like animation. I just don't think the movie was was terribly successful. Baby God on uh, HBO, I watched that. That was interesting. That's that's like false positive, which Hulu picked up this week, the Alana Glazer movie, about a doctor who keeps impregnating his patients. Um, and, and there was a lot of people who were like, you know, that's a terrible thing, but, you know, but I wouldn't have my son if he had, if this doctor hadn't impregnated me or whatever. Uh, So I thought that was interesting. I watched Greenland, the Gerard Butler movie, a guilty pleasure. You know, it it was, it wasn't as action heavy as I thought it might be. It was a little bit more emotional. It's more of a, an action drama, if you will. I think it's worth checking out Greenland. It's, it's a two and a half star movie. I don't think it's great by any stretch, but it's also not just a a throw it away piece of crap, uh, Jerry, Jerry Butler movie. I watched uh, a couple more minutes that two more, two, three more minutes. How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? The Bee Gees documentary on HBO was very good. Like I was shazamming every 30 seconds. Same thing with uh, Lover's Rock, by the way. Two great soundtracks. Uh, it wasn't real. Like I knew the Bee Gees from Saturday Night Fever and, and that kind of disco music. Had no idea some of the old stuff. Like th- these guys are amazing, incredible songwriters. Um, the only thing about the documentary, which was directed by Frank Marshall, is that it doesn't really get into like the, the brothers' discord too much and the addiction and some of the, the painful battles. And I think that this movie could have and should have been better, you know, if Frank Marshall hadn't just written like a two hour love letter or, or you know, made a two hour love letter to this band. Um, and it ends on a, on a very touching note though, that about, you know, Barry Gibbs says something to the effect of basically like, I'd give up all the hits and, and all the fame and all that stuff. If I could just be with my brothers, you know, for, for another few days. Uh, Hunter, Hunter. This is a Devin Sawa movie that not many of you will probably watch, but go and read the Hollywood reporter review of Hunter, Hunter, because they weren't lying. This is one of the most unforgettable endings to a movie. I think I've ever seen. I don't think I will ever forget the ending of Hunter, Hunter. It was fucking batshit insane. The movie itself was kind of a mess. Uh, I actually, you know, there are a bunch of characters getting killed off screen. It was kind of confusing in the second half. And it kind of plays a a game, you know, because it's like, well, am I watching a killer wolf movie? Am I watching a werewolf movie? Am I watching a serial killer movie? You don't know what the hell you're watching. But I'll tell you, by the end of it, it becomes real clear. Just shocking, shocking imagery. I, I thought it was fucking nuts. News of the World, I think I talked about a little bit on FYC, and there is a new Collider FYC uh, episode up. Uh, it was good. Good movie by Paul Greengrass. Good Tom Hanks performance. An Oscar contender? Yeah, it was fine. I it just it, it, it need a little bit more. It, it, did, it lacked the emotional punch that I think that movie should have had. Three more movies, all very good. Nomadland. Francis McDormand, one of the best movies I've seen all year. Um, probably the best picture frontrunner. Uh, love just how authentic it was. Chloe Zhao is just making movies that, uh, unlike anybody else making movies today, and, and Francis McDormand was tremendous in this. Um, definitely check out Nomadland, which is going to be coming out, I think, end of February. They, they made that limited release, sneaking in at the last second. Pieces of a Woman uh, started out incredible. The first 30, 45 minutes of Pieces of a Woman, absolutely gut-wrenching. You see Vanessa Kirby and Shia LaBeouf as they, they lose a baby. Um, I just thought that the second half of the movie kind of it kind of went off the rails a little bit uh, i think that that movie could have and should have been a little bit better but as it stands if you, if you can if you don't mind sitting through something really really sad and tough to watch it is worth a look 
And then finally, uh, we're going to end the show, Safety on Disney+. Plus. I love this movie. This is one of the top 15 movies I've seen this year. I know you'll think it's a formulaic Disney sports movie, um, but I, I got a lot out of it. You know, it, it battles some, some heavy themes for a Disney movie, like addiction. Um, it all comes down to like this sort of, end, you know, uh, the football player takes on the NCAA. And that's not really the movie that this is. I think it's a very touching movie about brotherhood, about the lengths one brother will go to for another. Um, and I thought that the, that the lead, Jay Reeves, was absolutely excellent. I, I wanted to make him up and comer of the month this month. And, and I submitted the request and everything. And then I realized, well, we actually just had an interview go up an hour ago with Jay Reeves. So I, I got beaten to the punch by one of my Collider colleagues. That's the way it goes sometimes. But I was super impressed by that guy. He's got a bright future ahead of him. Check out Safety if you like Disney sports movies. That'll do it for this episode of the Snyder Cut. You can uh, subscribe and, you know, all that fun stuff on YouTube, wherever podcasts uh, are found. We're on Megaphone these days, so every, and everything should be back up and running. You can check out the Collider.com podcast that Adam Chitwood and Mac Goldberg do as well. You can find me on Twitter at, at the Insider, on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Cameo, Cameo, Cameo. And, uh, and yeah, check out the Schmodown Spectacular, which is uh, available on, on YouTube for Patreons. Guys, stay warm out there. There's a blizzard here in Boston. I'm freezing my ass off. I've got my blanket. Ugh, have a good weekend, and I will see you before Christmas. Later. Later.